Being human with algorithms together with Bob Tarjan. Bob, could you please introduce yourself briefly? Uh, I grew up in Southern California. I got interested in mathematics from a very early age. Went to Caltech, took math courses, but I also took all the computing courses I could find because I, I got a chance to do programming very early. Went to Caltech, got a PhD, became interested in algorithms and algorithm design. Ran into Don Knuth and uh, also John Hopcroft, who was on sabbatical from from uh, Cornell and. Uh, uh, most of my career I've worked on design and analysis of algorithms as kind of the plumbing of computing, shall we say, which is if you want to do something complicated, you need the basics. You need data structures to be able to access information. You need data structures and algorithms to process graphs. This is the sort of thing I do. Okay, and uh, with that said, you are directly in the core of our motto, which is being human with algorithms. And when we thought about this motto, as we also discussed during the symposium some days ago, um, we thought about, okay, what, what does that mean? So being human with algorithms and the idea behind the motto was that we have this digital transformation that is ongoing so that people are more and more interacting either directly or indirectly with algorithms and in the more recent past with computer algorithms. And so this digital transformation, how does it get most apparent to you, this digital transformation, so that the society changes and the way you interact with things changes? I have a couple of different answers to that. I mean, in my personal life, I love to read the newspaper in the paper version, New yeah. York Times, but I can't always get it, so I get it online. But if I'm reading it on the phone, it's a much more constrained and different experience. It changes my interaction with the news. And I'm sure I'm like many other people, I'm too addicted to this device, reading email, reading news, and so on. I try to avoid social networks. Only I'm only on Facebook so I can see pictures of my children since they still use it. Um, <clears throat> but it's affecting all our lives in ways we don't understand. And I would also say, you know, I'm proud of the algorithms I've designed, but algorithm now has become a dirty word because uh, we have neural nets, we have quote unquote intelligent systems that are getting trained and making decisions for us in ways that we do not understand and cannot explain. It's having consequences in the real world and people start to question this for very good reason. Indeed, I went to a conference at NYU some number of years ago where this issue came up kind of in the early days when people were understanding the, the difficulties, the unintended consequences of all this technology that we have. So it's very important for us to think about the consequences of these systems. Mm -hmm. So it's, your answer is, is very interesting in many folds. So the, the, so you would say like one of the positive effects is definitely being able to have more connection to the, maybe also to the younger generation because they are using using these these tools like Facebook more when you say you have the pictures of your children there and so on. And uh, the, the other aspect is this algorithm. So I was also asking Tony Huar and uh, Steve Cook what is their definition of an algorithm. And so let's maybe... And so the answer was it's, it's basically it's a processing rule. Okay. And so maybe then I ask you something a little different, namely, um, why, why do you think is there this recent shift in the, in the meaning of algorithm? Or maybe it's not even a shift in the meaning of algorithm, but it's more this term with K KI, it became more used also for, for the general public. And then it started to have some of this negative connotation. So um, any thoughts to that? What, what happened to the term? Yes, yeah, so let me back up and, and say in my professional life, back to your first question, in yeah. my professional life it's incredible to have essentially all the world's scientific papers at my disposal. So if I want to read something, I can go find it on the web. And I'm fortunate to be at a university so I can get through various yeah. paywalls, which is a big problem. Yeah. But this ability to uh, get access to all the world's information, this is very significant and very yeah. positive. Now getting back to your question, the classical definition would be a step-by-step -step process, like a recipe. I want to bake a cake. 
here are the ingredients, the inputs, here are the steps to produce a cake. But uh, with the advent of, so a neural net is really just an algorithm. It's a big network. We don't have to go into the details. You feed in the inputs, does some simple computations, produces some outputs. It's not explicitly designed by any individual. How does it get constructed? You start out with essentially a blank slate. The structure is there. You feed in lots of examples. This, the, the internals get adjusted until such time as an output is produced. Is this an algorithm? It's not in the sense that I think of it, but it is an algorithm. And it, it, the, the word has become to mean any, any computation or any computer process, however it's conceived. Um, so it's interesting how this has evolved. <coughs> Sorry. Um. And when you when you t you do were just talking about artificial networks and that there it's like they're getting trained and then they do something, and uh, when you would translate them back into a processing rule because this is what people kind of tend to do when they want to understand what the what the neural network is doing, would you say that is then an algorithm again? If it were possible to translate it into something that a human could make sense out yeah. of, yes. Now the big difficulty is. Humans cannot make sense out of these things. They cannot explain themselves. Yeah. This is the challenge. If you get an output of one of these systems, yeah. and it has some human impact, like I'm getting a loan or I'm not getting a loan, you want to know why, especially if the decision is negative. Yeah. These systems cannot produce an explanation. This is one of the, the big issues. The other issue is that the underlying technology is very simple. In fact, it, it, huge networks, but what they're doing is very simple. But the reason they're having this kind of impact is because of the data that's coming in. So people uh, uh, question algorithms. They ask whether they have some inherent bias or not. It, they, they start out with a blank slate. Whatever bias there is is coming in from the data. So maybe we're just getting revealed uh, the kinds of biases that exist in society, or maybe the data is somehow selected in such a way that the selection process introduces bias. Mm -hmm. in, in either case, it's the whole system that is producing the result. It's the data in combination with the computing that is producing the result. And I think it's inherent in the use of these systems uh, that they have some human oversight, especially mm -hmm. if they're being used in places where the decisions matter greatly to people's lives yeah and so this also and an in a very interesting and important point this um the algorithms being an amplifier of what the humans put in i'm just thinking about this uh, microsoft chatbot that started being racist and so on because the just the training data that it got was racist and so it just an amplified this thing out yes and this example also raises the issue that again the data that you put in uh, if you're in an adversarial setting yes. where somebody with malicious intent is controlling the system or using the system, they may be able to, even something that's already been trained, you may be able to feed inputs into it in such a way that you can produce yeah. any behavior you want. Yeah. And this is no good. And, and then, like said, taking what you said before, um, it will be difficult to identify because you, you essentially don't know what the what these weights on the different functions what they actually mean in the end so if you tr if you continue training the neural network and someone puts adversarial adversarial data in then it it shifts and then as you cannot understand what it does you have the problem coming yes exactly and, and so w would you say for for these artificial neural networks would you say that the um, the key challenge is making it understandable for humans or what would you say is the biggest algorithmic I, I challenge think, there well i think making that making the outputs understandable for humans making the behavior understandable for humans and having some human filter in the process by which these systems, where these systems are used, so that uh, if they're producing some questionable be behavior, at least you have some kind of recourse. I think putting these places in, in, in play, I mean, autonomous cars, right? We're going to have very interesting challenges with 
self-driving cars. People have raised these issues before. Yeah. Um, there, it's kind of hard to put the human in the loop because the accident is over yeah. before the human can react. So yeah. we need to be very careful with these, yeah. these systems. Mm -hmm. um, in, in that direction, uh, what, what would you say is the, uh, is the current uh, challenge, how one would formulate the Turing test? So, because like when, when so it, they, I'm, I'm having in mind this this comic now like on the internet nobody can distinguish if you're a human or a light bulb. Yes. Because it's just the, with the limited interaction that you can have in a chat, for instance, or like even when you think about these most advanced techniques like the AlphaGo and so on. Um, if you would give it to someone who doesn't know that the technology exists, this someone would probably not be able to distinguish if it's a human or if it's a, if it's a machine. No one has come up with a better definition of intelligence than the Turing test, but one has to lengthen the time period or expand the possibility of questions mm -hmm. in order to capture the right notion somehow. Computers do very well in well-defined fields. They do very well at understanding images. But if you see the system, if you have the system, you can tweak a few pretzels, uh, pixels and yeah. turn a dog into yes. a cat or a horse yes. or a stop sign or something. Yes. This is, these systems are very brittle. Yeah. They, in, the, in the context in which they were trained or designed, yeah. even though we don't understand what they're doing, they yeah. perform better than people. But change the rules and all of a sudden uh, their limitations become apparent. So we need to understand their limits as well as their potential. And, uh, w would you say that the uh, artificial intelligence algorithms are used too much uh, prematurely at the moment by some companies because they are overhyped and at the same time it's like if anything that promises AI is in the product sells better so let's just use it even though we don't understand what it does? Uh, there is certainly hype. I'm not an expert enough in the field to be able to answer no. that specific no. question. Okay. I just say that one should be careful about hype and be yeah. careful about yeah. testing and evaluating. You know, artificial intelligence has been through these cycles yeah. of hype and crashing, and I am sure we're now in a hype phase, yeah. so there's going to be some crashing or gradual slowdown or something yeah. here, I think, as we become aware of the limitations of these yeah. systems. And uh, coming back to, to, to your fields, to the to the algorithms. So, from a from a not total outsider, but uh, like not being totally into your field, um, t to me it makes the impression that um, this artificial intelligence seems to be a key ingredient or building block to push algorithms to the next level. Because now we can bring something in that we could not have before, which one might call intelligence or fuzziness or something like that. So you do, do you consider it an important building block, having this artificial intelligence making some leaps now? Not for the kind of things I do. I would yeah. love to be able to use this to analyze yeah. algorithms, but yeah. even very simple algorithms pose incredible challenges, and uh, AI is certainly not there yet. Yeah. Okay. It's, it, it's really good for certain very important problems. Image recognition, yeah. speech translation. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be important in medical situations and in law and so on. But again, I think you need the human interaction along with the... Use the expertise of the AI system to get a start or get an idea, but yeah. then evaluate it. Let's put people in the loop yeah. somehow. Okay, cool. Um, uh, what would you say um, is currently the, the biggest challenge you are either working on or you would love to find a solution for? Well, I used to, I have done mostly sequential algorithms over my career where there's one processor doing one thing at a yeah. time. But, and, and I always get asked in lectures, what about memory hierarchies? or multiple processors. So the last several years I've been looking at concurrent algorithms, parallel algorithms. There have been decades of work in this area, but now with big data, big graphs, Hadoop, MapReduce, uh, all of a sudden some of these algorithms can be used in practice. But it turns out the engineers building the systems haven't necessarily used the old theoretical results. So there's there is vast opportunity to uh, 
bring the old ideas into the new systems and actually develop new ones that match the current hardware. So those are the kind of problems I'm looking at. <laughs> and um, so the, uh, a, a risk that people often say that comes with this digital transformation is that lots of data is collected and uh, then uh, profiles of people are created. So there are attacks to the privacy by having digital personas and so on. And um, um, what, 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 do, what do you think about that? So is it that um, today we have indeed multiple personas, like we are in the physical world and then also we are in the digital world and we, is this like concurrent? Is it like, or is it coherent? It's not coherent, but they can all be tied together, which is a big problem. I think the EU took a big step, and I think privacy is an important problem. And people do not realize how much privacy we've actually lost. Uh, security and privacy are only becoming more and more important. Uh, and uh, in, in that direction, um, at least in, in Germany, I, I see a, a big problem for the for the education of children, how to get, um, let's call it media literacy or digital age literacy. And this also has to do with um, truth and not truth of information, for instance. So. Yes, yes. I have no good ideas as to how to educate school children, but we have the same problem with the scientific literature. I, I tell my students always, read papers critically, question everything that's in the paper, because you know, just because a great person wrote it or just because it's published doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean there aren't things missing. So somehow we have to develop, uh, we have to train kids how to think. You have to train kids how to think, how to read skeptically, how to interpret what they see. Uh, I think it's a big challenge. And uh, also in that direction, would you say we have an information over flooding? <laughs> yes and no. Uh, they, there is this phenomenon of compartmentalization of information, which is to say these systems try to feed you information on the basis of what you already looked at. So there's all this information but you end up getting focused down on some small part of it so you end up in some world which is different from everybody else's world we need some way to introduce randomness tie things together so people get a broader view i think there are interesting challenges there are uh, filter bubbles something new probably not we just think of them as new there's nothing new under the sun actually yeah. Um, so, uh, about this digital transformation, there are positive and negative aspects. What would you say is the most negative aspect? Well, uh, the filter bubble is a big one, but yeah. I think the privacy issue is another big one, and I don't have a view as to which one is more important, but they're both serious. And uh, w with the privacy, I always see the uh, there's a huge difference between Europe and the U.S., for instance. Meaning, like, in or Germany and the U.S. In Germany, people are <coughs> being at least a little bit more sensitive and being more like, okay, data is first of all mine, and even if I don't believe it myself, the state takes care that it doesn't get to everybody, and they have to double agree and whatever. While in the U.S., it's more like, okay, I give everything away, and uh, then. Uh, yeah, let's see, the fortunate one might catch it and do something with it. I hope we don't have a really bad experience in the U.S. I, I'm a little optimistic because since the EU is being more restrictive, the U.S. companies want to operate in the EU. Maybe yeah. the restrictive policies carry over into the U.S. So. Yeah. Okay. And uh, coming to the positive aspects, what would you say is the most positive aspect? of the digital transformation? Access to all the world's information anytime you want it, as long as you can distinguish fact from fiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, there I have to ask the, a second thing, namely, um, do you perceive that the, that the skills of the people change from knowing something towards knowing how to find something? And is this a bad thing or a good thing? Uh, it's important to know how to find things, 
there's only a finite amount of stuff we can hold in our heads somehow. So there's some kind of working set. You can really expand your ability to do work or to think about problems or whatever, or to function in the real world, if you can leverage information. You can, but you can't keep it all in your head at once. So knowing, no, learning how to learn is more important than knowing any particular thing. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I could continue asking you for hours, but the time is uh, almost up. So uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for the uh, for the for the interview. So last question is, um, being human with algorithms, our motto. So when you hear it, what what does it mean to you? Trying to understand how people interact with digital, the digital world, how the the real world interacts with the digital world and how the world of people interacts with the world of machines. Okay, perfect. Bob, thank you very much. You're welcome.